Day zero is the moment before company formation. When a founder decides to take the plunge, follow their dream, and commit to pursuing their vision of change. On day zero, you'll hear founders tell their story. From the initial idea, through reactions by critics and skeptics, setbacks and successes, we'll cover it all. Behind every company is a founder with ambition, goals, dreams, and wisdom to be shared. Let's explore them together. Hey, good afternoon, Gary. How are you? I'm well, Nathan. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon to you. Well, thanks so much for uh, for joining. This is going to be a real treat to uh, to interview you. Typically, you're on the other side of the mic interviewing others, so I, it's uh, it's a great correct. pleasure for me to uh, to have the opportunity to interview you today. Thank you. I think I might like it better actually asking the questions, Nathan. <laughs> but yeah. we'll try it out. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I can fill your shoes, but we'll give it a shot. Uh, we'll give it a cool. shot. Yeah, today. you'll do. You'll do great. Yeah. Well, um, so for for all of our guests uh, joined here, obviously by Gary Bisbee. Gary is the co-founder and, and chairman of Think Medium. Uh, many guests may know him from previous postings, including most recently as a co-founder, CEO, and chairman of the Health Management Academy. Um, but Gary, what a lot of probably listeners will not know uh, is going back, you've been an entrepreneur for your entire career, or most of your career, I should say. Um, yep, most of it. And, uh, uh, but going back even beyond that, tell us a little bit about you know, your background. Where did you grow up and, and kind of what, was, uh, what were some of those early forces that, uh, that really shaped your, your view of the world and, and really helped form your entrepreneurial spirit? It's interesting when you look back on it. Uh, my dad was a minister, which it turns out was very important part of my life uh, for a variety of different reasons. I grew up in primarily in Duluth, Minnesota, spent some time before that in Boston, uh, but went to junior high school and high school in Duluth. My main goal in those days was athletics. I was uh, played all sports, but was a hockey player, played for a couple of years at the University of Minnesota Duluth before I hurt my knee, but I also was learning at my dad's knee how to run a church. And most people probably don't think of ministers as business people or as entrepreneurs, but he really was. And so although I didn't, um, I didn't believe <laughs> the way he believed and, and wouldn't have been a good minister from that standpoint, from standpoint of learning about business and how you run a church and how you meet people and what they actually want. Um, that was a very formative part of my life. Following education then went on to um, <clears throat> pursue um, singing, actually, and I was an opera singer for several years. Nathan, you, <laughs> you know that. Most people don't. Uh, I was an opera singer for several years. And and that worked out uh, to be really an enjoyable part of my life. I learned a lot of lessons about people. And the primary one is you have to sing what people want to hear, not necessarily what you want to sing. Right. And that principle has paid, guided right? me. <laughs> yeah, if you want to get paid, right. right. That principle has guided me uh, pretty much uh, pretty much throughout my life, actually. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Well, we'll um I'm sure many people don't know that about you, at least from a, your background as, a, as an opera singer. But tell us a little bit more about, you know, education, you know, kind of when you moved from uh, uh, singing or, or deciding that your, your career was not uh, going to be the longevity of an opera singer was not something that was in, in the cards for you and how you moved into the business world. Yeah, for sure. One thing that another important part about what my dad offered me was as a minister, the uh, CEO of the local hospital was in our church. And there was an interesting position in that hospital for high school kids. And it was being a wall washer in a hospital. And uh, typically there were eight doctor's kids that were in that position. But during the time I was in high school, uh, it was seven doctor's kids and a preacher's kid. And so I learned over the course of three summers a lot about healthcare and made up my mind right then that I was going to be in healthcare. I uh, wasn't particularly interested in being a hospital administrator, but uh, I loved healthcare and, and decided I was going to be there. Ended up, did working in hospitals after opera singing for a while in medical center hospitals and 
learned a lot, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, wanted to get a business degree, went off to Wharton and got my degree in finance and healthcare. And then it was an interesting time for me because I'd always wanted to go to Wall Street and learn finance, but I realized that if I was going to stay in healthcare, I really needed a clinical degree to go along with the business degree, just to understand uh, all about healthcare and the delivery of healthcare. Uh, so I went to Yale to get a PhD in chronic disease epidemiology. Unremarkable, other than um, I was basically told by the uh, director of graduate studies that my dissertation needed to be part of the development of DRGs. And it was something I wanted to do anyway. But uh, so there I learned about data and learned about uh, grouping data and clinical data and financial data and so on. And that was very formative to the rest of my life. Uh, and it also taught me about health policy, particularly because uh, when Congress was contemplating passing the DRG legislation, they wanted somebody from Yale to come down and testify and talk to the staff and so on. And since I was a junior faculty member and none of the senior faculty members wanted to do that, uh, I was elected. So I spent a fair amount of time in Washington for two, three years. And that was also a very formative part of my life, really understanding much more about uh, about health policy. Well, so I know, you know, on this show on day zero, we obviously focus on founders and their founding experience in the background and, and try to develop lessons for other founders. When you look at your educational, you know, background, which is you know, just absolutely top notch going to, you know, to Wharton and receiving a, an MBA and then, then Yale at a PhD, you know, was one of those two experiences more, um, you know, formative in, in kind of setting the, the arc of your career trajectory or were they both equally formative just in, in different ways? I think the latter point, I feel that what I learned in graduate school was really less about um, the coursework and more about the model. And so I learned a, a management model at Wharton and I learned a clinical model at Yale. And I've used both of those for the rest of my life in healthcare. Uh, so I don't think one was more important than the other. Once I, once I did um, really focus on becoming an entrepreneur, I did realize that I needed some financial experience. And so went to Wall Street for six or eight years. That was very formative. Um, and so once I had the manage management degree, the clinical degree, and then my Wall Street experience, I really felt I was ready to go. And uh, that kind of was what jump-started my career as an entrepreneur. Well, that's a great transition. So, so where did you move? You you received your PhD and you worked at Yale for a few years and and the HA at the Trust. You went to Wall Street, but then after you left Wall Street, that's when you had your you know your first real entrepreneurial experience. Maybe sh share a little bit about that with uh, uh, with the listeners. I had a an interesting situation when I was at Kidder Peabody on Wall Street. In that a gentleman came in to conduct a financing for uh, a very interesting project, which is he had a small uh, publicly traded uh, company in the orthopedic space, and we wanted to merge it or reverse merge it uh, into a nonprofit, actually, company. And it was a transaction that was too small for Kidder, but I found it be pretty interesting. Um, and so we ended up basically agreeing and I left Kidder and became the CEO of, of this small company and conducted the transaction uh, in what now is Hanger Orthopedic Group, which is a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, and that was really my first experience. Um, I, I liked that transaction, wasn't sure that business is the right business for me. Uh, but then had an opportunity to uh, basically found Apache Medical Systems, which was an outcomes company for critical care patients, uh, large databases, and so on. And and that really was much more 
kind of where I wanted to go. So um, I left Hangar, went to Apache, and we we ran that, grew that, and ultimately sold it. Uh, but uh, that was my first two uh, first two entrepreneurial experiences. So making making that jump, particularly let's let's spend a second on Hangar and just that first you know experience really you know, diving headfirst into the, you know, the deep end of the pool, so to speak, from an entrepreneurial perspective. Um, you know, what were some of the key lessons that you learned from that first experience that you were able to apply to to later experiences? Well, Hangar fundamentally during the time I was there and, and after I left was a consolidation play. So it was consolidating uh, orthotics and prosthetics practices and I learned a lot about people and learned the fact that when people who owned a business and grew the business, they they felt very strongly about the business. And so that gave me a lot of um, sense that uh, dealing with people in one way or another was going to be a critical part of my life as an entrepreneur. Uh, and I carried that into Apache. And then with Apache, uh, it was really dealing with physicians in large medical centers. Uh, and there was just enough of Apache since it, w- it was a predictive model as well as uh, a real-time data reporting model, uh, but it would predict life expectancy in the ICU. So that that pulled us into the whole ethics uh, end of the business. So dealing with physicians and dealing with ethicists of one kind or another in health systems, that was, um, I think, made more possible because of my early experiences at Hangar, where I was dealing with people that had a very strong vested interest in their own business. Share a little bit with us about, you know, Apache um, and, and then, you know, what came next, which was, you know, a, an organization that you spent, you know, have spent a, a significant portion of your career with, um, you know, 20 plus years from founding to, you know, to, to kind of exit, which was the Health Management Academy. Um, so talk a little bit about the founding of that company, where, you know, the kind of the idea for that came from and, and that journey. So Apache was very interesting uh, in that a team of four Two physicians, a PhD and a nurse, team of four people uh, connected to George Washington, George Washington University had created the Apache methodology. And they, uh, this, this was a methodology that fundamentally uh, classed patients in terms of how critically ill they were. Uh, and it was their um, kind of next step to create a database so that they could bounce any given patient against that database and thereby develop a predict a prediction about life expectancy. Um, and so I came, uh, came around right at that time and, and the company was created and we grew it. But the key there was that um, really had to deal with physicians, had to deal with chief medical officers, had to deal with health system and large academic medical center leadership. And um, that was a springboard into founding the academy. Sherry Jones, my co-founder at the Health Management Academy, had been the VP of sales and marketing at Apache. So obviously we knew each other well. And when we sold um, Apache, then we decided to found the academy. And the idea there was to create a peer group of individuals that were similar in terms of the kind of role they played in the health systems. And large health systems were relatively new at that point, having more or less just been created. Uh, So we decided to create a chief medical officer forum, as we called it. And that was wildly successful, much to our delight. And so we created another forum for chief uh, chief financial officers and on and on and on. Uh, so the academy was a uh, a convening organization, uh, and the idea was for uh, executives of large health systems to learn from each other. And then uh, you came along uh, about ten years after we had founded uh, 
the academy. And of course, you led our whole health policy effort and really did a terrific job uh, building up the thought leadership side of what we did there. So the organization was both a convening organization with executives learning from each other and uh, in the company providing thought leadership. Uh, we ended up uh, selling that company uh, in a transaction that uh, was, we thought, the right thing to do at that stage in the company's life. And the new management team led by Rene De Silva is doing a terrific job. So we we felt comfortable with uh, the transaction with uh, Welch, Carson, Anderson, and Stowe, uh, a large private equity firm. Yeah, well, it's exciting. Well, certainly it was a, an exciting um, time for me, a fun time to to be a part of the organization and to see the growth and to work with you and uh, and Sherry and all the other great you know coworkers and, and colleagues at the academy. Um, but I think that gets to kind of an interesting point. You know, as, as a show that's really focused on entrepreneurs and their experience, um, you know, one of the things that, that I think about um, as it relates to some of the more entrepreneurial endeavors that I've had and talking to friends who are entrepreneurs is, you know, when you, when you have an idea, you know, what is the mental model that you go through to say, is this a good idea? Is it a bad idea? How do you vet it? Obviously, being within an industry, you were in healthcare uh, at Apache, so we'll use the academy example. You know, you knew healthcare. You came up through healthcare. Your your academic background was in healthcare. Your professional background had been in healthcare in different places, finance and, and academia, and and you had the hangar experience, then the Apache experience. So, so what model did you use when you were thinking about the academy? How did you you know know that was going to be a good idea? Did you know is probably a better question that it was going to be an idea yeah. that worked when you started the organization? And maybe talk a little bit about that and that framework of how you you think about that. I mean, it's it, it's a very good question. I've started five companies uh, in one way or another, so I've been through this before. I've probably had 20 ideas, Nathan, <laughs> and you've, you and I have talked about a lot of them. Uh, so how do you conclude where the right idea is to pursue? And I think uh, I've always had an instinct and I've gone with my instincts. Uh, I think that's very important for me, at least. And the second thing I do is I really think it's important to listen to people who will be customers or or just have a really good view of the landscape. And so before I start something, before we started the academy, we probably talked to 50 people, uh, 50 doctors primarily, uh, or other kinds of executives that we thought would be interested in the academy. And we received a lot of positive feedback. It seemed like it really was going to be a good idea. We modeled out the finances and uh, we said, why not? And so that's the way that one went. Some of the, some of the follow on ideas have been um, a little trickier in that the business models weren't as obvious as the academy business model was. And so when you have to kind of decide is this a good idea at the same time you're trying to make the business model work? That can be a little uh, challenging. <laughs> there is a uh, willingness to accept risk that entrepreneurs have uh, that others don't. And I've talked to a lot of people with great ideas and have suggested, why don't you go start the company? It's a great idea. And they said, no, we just, I just don't have that risk tolerance to, to do it. So uh, I think a lot of it is, one, just what's your instinct to listen to other people that could have good views of it or might be customers. And then three, you just have to be willing to, to tolerate the risk. And uh, at that point, it's time to hop on a sliding board and, <laughs> and down you go. Yeah, you know, interesting. Well, that... You know, very, um, very insightful. And I think that, you know, one of the key takeaways from that is, you know, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs or founders will, you know, talk to people about their idea. They'll, they'll say, is this a good idea, a bad idea? What do you think? But, you know, that nuance of, of really starting with your potential customers, at least if not exclusively, but certainly as a, as a large subset of the group 
uh, that you're soliciting feedback from is really interesting. I would say that, you know, maybe some entrepreneurs do that or some founders, but probably a lot just go to their network or go to very respected people, but not necessarily um, individuals who would be customers. In some ways, you're kind of getting their buy-in or you're receiving their buy-in right. to be a customer before you even ask, you know, so, yep. quote, you know, so to speak, ask for the order uh, for them to, to join or to become one. You're getting that buy-in and building that momentum, uh, you know, uh, out of the gate. Whether it's starting a new company or starting a product within a company, every time I haven't paid attention to prospective customers, it just slowed down the progress. So uh, I've learned that you just really have to do that. As you know, at the Academy, we started who knows how many, 30 or 40 new products probably or services. And we didn't start any of them without going to the uh, to the customers and finding out if they thought it was a good idea. They don't always know how to package it or or what the model business model is, but they do know whether it makes sense to them as a service that they'd like to participate in. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, let's shift a little bit. I think this is reflective of, of the Academy, but probably of all of your, you know, entrepreneurial and, you know, founding experiences. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of listening uh, to the customer. One of the things that I think you do really well, having worked with you, is is listen to the customer. I've also heard many others um, that have worked with you say that, that you're, you're good at listening, you're good at receiving, you know, that feedback, whether it's good or bad. You're good at taking that feedback and crafting it into something um you know, new and different, but, but would love to hear you talk a little bit about, you know, do you have a model for that? How do you think about that? Um, you know, talk about it in the context of the Academy, but also other, you know, Apache or even think medium now, um, how you, how you are taking that feedback and the importance of that and whether you have a model, um, you know, that you'd be willing to share with, uh, with others. I don't know if it's as formalized as a model. It probably ought to be. My father was a really good listener and he would listen to the parishioners in his church and then would would act on that. And so I grew up with that kind of model and saw that it worked for him and just seemed to me to be a natural way to proceed. Uh, maybe, Nathan, if I was smarter, more creative, I wouldn't have to talk to so many people. But uh, But I just always get good ideas from them or I shape what I'm about to do uh with by through talking to uh to these potential customers um or perhaps customers in other ways so uh, i think the main thing is the more you gain input uh and it's not always going to be positive input uh but the more you gain input the more you can shape your thinking it develops a certain amount of depth uh develops richness and uh, I think having learned from these various companies, Think Medium was interesting because I knew I wanted to uh, interview people and I knew that that was primary research. So the question is, what do you do with that research? Uh, I also thought that um, leadership development and education and learning has always been part of my life and that I really felt that uh, there was a virtuous circle, so to speak, with uh, the interviews where you can film them like we're doing today. So it's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be audio and Apple Podcasts or other podcasts. And there's going to be written uh, word. And if you can do those three, then I think you can create the right service mix for customers. Some people don't want to watch it on uh, YouTube. Some people don't want to listen to it. Some people may just want to read it or, you know, maybe they don't want to read, they want to watch. So if you can offer all three mediums, hence the name Think Medium, uh, then I think you're basically putting people in a position where they can consume what you're doing in a way that they want to consume it. I view that as personalization. And, um, I, again, personalization to me is basically a function of listening. I think it all comes from, uh, from listening. Yeah. Yeah. That's really important. And, um, and makes a lot of sense. It's simple, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, well, would love to, to shift a little bit to your experiences, 
I would call it kind of observing and advising other entrepreneurs, which you've done a fair amount of. Uh, you've been on, uh, I don't know how many uh, corporate boards, but many corporate boards of both public and, and private uh, companies, uh, not only in the healthcare IT space and knowledge services, but really, you know, across the board. When you, when you shift from, from kind of your, your founder um, entrepreneur hat and move into, you know, your advisor hat, which I'm, I'll use that term broadly, but thinking about boards or other types of, of advisory engagements, you know, what are some of the things that you look for um, uh, in, in those that you're working with and how do you kind of judge them and what's some of the, the advice that you give them um, from a, you know, kind of a, a statesman or, or an advisor position? First of all, I must say it was hard for me to make that transition because I'm an operator at heart. I just wanted to do it. And uh, when you're advising or on a board of directors, uh, somebody else is going to do it and you're there trying to figure out how to best provide guidance to them. I guess I've been on 10 or 11 boards and I think that they're all different and the one of the key things I found about boards of directors is chemistry of a company and chemistry of a board is all important. And so I play a different role in every board I've been on. Um, you know, some boards may require more of my IT expertise or more of a uh, relationship with, with certain types of customers. But the point of the matter is each one requires me to play a different role. And I think that's been very important in terms of the boards I played, uh, boards I've sat on. The, the second thing is obvious, but it's not always uh, well executed. And that is the difference between management and governance. Uh, and you just have to understand where that line is and be very, very dedicated to not going over that line uh, as a board member. Uh, you can advise, uh, and there's certain uh, information that you can provide, but you can't operate. So you really need to not confuse the fact that governance means governance and management means management. That particular point I've applied to my advisory uh, roles. So when I'm talking to a entrepreneur, somebody who's leading a company, I'm pretty careful about just advising and that really gets to listening. So I find that you need to dig into the entrepreneur, uh, you dig into why they're doing this and what they're thinking about and what they're trying to accomplish and where they have anxieties, let's say. Um, and then you can provide advice that fits that particular individual at that particular time. Uh, otherwise, you're a bit of a bull in a china closet. And um, I think that advising, to, to be good at advising, it needs to be pretty nuanced, pretty targeted, uh, and it can change over time. Uh, you can, you can, you know, somebody might have a need this year, next year, it could be completely different. So um, again, I think the governance work and the advising work is somewhat similar in that you're not actually management, you're either governance or advisor, and you really need to uh, understand the difference between those two. So for, for a founder, um, and this may be different based on the stage of the company, uh, and I'm certain, certainly will be different based on the, the, um, you know, the sector or subsector the company is in. But when you think about forming a board, um, particularly forming that first board or that early board, um, you, you know, presumptively you'll have investors, um, who are on that, on that board. But when you're looking at that from an entrepreneur or founder's perspective, how should they think about forming that early board and, and growing the board? What are the competencies they should, should be looking for? And then how should they be thinking differently as the company, you know, hopefully knock on wood grows and continues to mature and, and how does that, uh, how does that change? Yeah, that latter point is really a good point. I had the good fortune of um, taking Cerner Corporation public when I was an investment banker. And Neil Patterson, one of the founders and the CEO, asked me to sit on that board. I've been on the board for 30 years or so. So I was 
really part of and watching Neil as a CEO grow from nothing, basically maybe 15 or $20 million when I met him to 5 billion. And this question you're asking is so important, which is at various points in time in a company's life, you need certain types of board members. And I watched Neil go through that. I've gone through that to a lesser degree. (laughs) No company I've had has ever grown to be a multi-billion dollar company, that's for sure. But they have grown. And as they've grown, you really do need to uh, think about board members. I I find the most important uh, characteristic of a good board member Uh, and this won't surprise you, is somebody that can listen and ask the right questions. And I found as as I have been the leader of companies, uh, it's it's amazing how the well-placed question can just cause a complete uh, change in how I'm thinking and how I can approach a particular problem or a particular situation. So uh, I think that really good board members are the ones that can kind of plug into the situation, kind of think along with you, and then ask the right question that's going to really make a difference. Um, and whether they're, uh, whether they're an investor or uh, an expert uh, in some particular area, I find is almost less important than that they can really feel where the company is, what the company needs, and then ask the right questions to... Uh, to help you uh, react. Now you have to be smart enough to listen uh, and to what they're asking and then you work through the answers. But uh, to me, that's probably the most important characteristics uh, characteristic of a board member. Yeah. And you know, with the caveat that there's an exception to to every rule um, or maybe many exceptions to, to some rules um, you know, what do you think about size? Is there a size that is a, you know, is a good size? Is there a, too small or too big? How do you think about the right size uh, of a board? And does that change or should it change as a company matures and, and grows? Yeah, I think clearly, clearly there can be too many people on the board because if you have too many, it's hard for them to focus. Um, in fact, I was just interviewing Jeff Immel, former CEO of GE, uh, within the last several weeks and ended up asking him that same question, Nathan. And he was saying that in the height of the financial crisis, uh, that board had grown from, I believe it was nine members to 18. And he said it was horrible because they just could not focus. They couldn't develop camaraderie, uh, and there were just too many agendas. So I've always thought that less than 10 is the right number, at least for, um, for any of my companies. Cerner has clipped along with about nine members for a number of years, and that always felt like the right number to me. It allowed everybody to speak. It allowed everybody to play a role. Uh, it allowed them to buy into the strategy to company. Um, I know our large health systems, uh, which started out as um, hospitals, many of them, and then they grouped together to form a health system. And for one reason or another, they ended up with more than 20. I think the average size 10, 15 years ago was 25 board members. And their uh, average now is probably 15. So they're working their way down. And I think if you ask most CEOs, they'd probably say they'd they'd love to have uh, 11 or even fewer board members. Now, if you're an academic medical center where philanthropy is a huge part of the purpose of the board, then you're going to end up with many more people. But uh, but the executive committees and that small group that really uh, makes the decisions probably much you know much closer to to nine or ten people. Thinking back across your um, your entrepreneurial career and and you know founding five companies is as you've said. Um, what are some of the key lessons learned if you were sitting across the table from uh, an individual that was getting ready to start a company, um, or had an idea and was thinking about, you know, conceptually, should I do this or not? What are a few of the key takeaways from your experiences that you would, you would love to share, um, you know, with that, with that individual? 
You know, Drucker's the one that said the purpose of a company is to um, understand the value of your customer. And I think that is probably the key lesson in all of this. Uh, and, you know, I'm as we talked about, I'm interested in listening and find that to be really important part of the way I approach things. But that is listening to really determine what the value is for the customer. And no matter what company I've been involved in, that re it really comes down to that. So if I'm advising uh, an entrepreneur, I'm trying to ask questions in a way to have the entrepreneur continue to focus on answering that question. What is the value of the customer? Uh, and then how can we best answer it? What I found as... Um, as the leader of a company that's you know starts out with a couple of employees and then grows is every person in that company has to be a leader in whatever role they're in and i find that um, if if people that um, are running leading small companies they don't always get that point and i think it's uh, so important that if you've got two people, five people, 10 people, or 200 people in a company, everybody really needs to be a leader. And if you treat them that way and you define their role that way, I think it just uh, pays great dividends for the company. Uh, so out of all of the work that I've done in this space, I think uh, those are probably the two key points. Uh, I mean, there's obviously a lot of questions about finance and investing and and valuation and uh you know how do you get an introduction and how do you position what you're doing and all that is obviously vitally important but to me determining the value uh for the customer uh it starts with that and then having everybody in the company believe that they're a leader of that company those are probably the two two key takeaways for me before we wrap up, tell us a little bit about Think Medium. So this is your your newest endeavor, uh, your yep. newest the newest company that that you founded. Um, tell us a little bit about Think Medium and and what the uh, what the plans are for it and where you want it to go and and what what would uh, you may not know what it would look like in four or five years, but if you if you do look into your crystal ball, how do you see the company looking? You know, three, four, or five years out. Well, let's start with what Think Medium is meant to be, <clears throat> and then maybe we can work out a few years. I just felt that executives today are so busy, um, and they need to engage uh, in learning about leadership, the younger ones in particular, but even, even those that are more experienced. And so um, I wanted to, to see how could you provide information to them that was efficient and personalized and shaped for uh, for their kind of view of learning. And so the idea of Think Medium is to interview uh, individuals that have some similarity um, and then see what we can learn from them, explore their thinking. So we started with her story, which is basically women interviewing other women. Um, and the focus is again on leadership. It's primarily healthcare and what lessons can you learn from each other? Uh, that's that, that defines the smaller group, uh, the audience clearly directed at women, although I think 30%, 35% of the audience are actually men. We're trying to provide a opportunity for women to share their, their views about leadership. Uh, and then the second show is, is the Gary Bisbee show. And the purpose there is to interview uh, senior executives, CEOs, authors, others. Uh, and again, it's all about learning. And uh, we uh, believe in people in several mediums, people being able to look at it, listen to it, and then read. And then there are several other shows. Uh, one of them is Day Zero, which is interviewing entrepreneurs, primarily healthcare, but broadening out uh, 
to include other um, other areas. If we can use these interviews as our primary research and then uh, develop thought leadership out of that, so there's a creative approach to learning, uh, I'll be very happy. So four or five years from now, I think we'll have more shows. I think we'll have opportunities for people to learn. Uh, we won't be convening people like the Health Management Academy does. That's not in the cards here. But uh, providing information about leadership and and learning and um, really trying to help people uh, realize their potential uh, is what we're about. Well, it's exciting. All the shows are exciting. Her story was a you know just a fabulous show, and and uh, of course we all love the Gary Bisbee show. Uh, and it's exciting to be a part of uh, of Day Zero and to interview you for. Uh, for that, I, I think this has been fantastic. You know, a couple of of the things that you discussed, Gary, really hit home for me. The first being, you know, when you're founding a company to make sure everyone feels like they're a leader and that they have a role and an important role. Um, and I think that's so important. I, I obviously experienced that at, at the Academy, and I think that was important there. But it's such a great piece of advice for, for entrepreneurs and for you know, and for founders um, everywhere. And then I think, of course, just listening. Uh, we all know that it's uh, it's something we should do, but I feel like so often uh, we don't do it or don't do it um, as well or as often uh, as we should. So just great pieces of advice for uh, for founders and entrepreneurs and potential founders and and for those who are just curious and just wanted to hear your story and uh, and to listen. So thanks so much for uh, for joining today. This has been fantastic, and uh, we'll have to do it again. We've got lots of stories we didn't tell, so yep. we've got yeah. we'll we'll have to reserve some time. That may not be they may not make the cut for uh, for one of the shows, but uh, but but they're uh, they're certainly good for uh, for a drink or for a cocktail. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of stories, some we can share publicly, some of which we won't. <laughs> right. But it's uh, it's great to, to be together with you again, Nathan, and uh, have you as part of the team here. We're all excited about it. So welcome aboard. Yeah, likewise. It's, uh, it's exciting and it'll be fun. So, well, thanks again, Gary. And uh, we'll look right. forward to the upcoming episodes with others. 